I'm going to try to focus in on people less than 65 and what we know, which is really not uh, very much. But we do know a lot about how we approach chest pain, and pretty much every cardiologist and most internists and other physicians and clinicians have to address the issue of chest pain. What do we do? How do we move forward when that symptom presents? Uh, first of all, I have nothing to declare related to this presentation. Um, and I am going to focus specifically on what we have seen evolve from the guidelines. And I think this is important because this is in a 10-minute talk, a synthesis of where we are, at least, at least where we think we are, with regards to the literature itself. So um, first of all, we're going to focus on how we approach the acute chest pain patient, because this is part of the guidelines, but it's really a separate topic. We have chronic stable coronary artery disease with stable chest pain, and then we have acute presentations. Should they be addressed differently? And I think the answer is overwhelmingly yes. So first of all, we have to perform some sort of risk assessment in the acute chest pain syndromes in the emergency department. Pretty much a low-risk individual, no further testing, and we'll move forward and define that. Perhaps intermediate risk, we have to do a little bit more diagnostic assessment. And then obviously the high-risk patient, uh, we're going to move towards treatment as quickly as we can. I'm not going to address treatment of chest pain either in the acute setting or the chronic, but I'm going to try to give us an assessment of what do we do with that diagnosis and how do we move forward. So, of course, we have various risk models and we have a number of different scores that have been uh, promulgated through the uh, literature. I think the heart score and the EDAC score are the most commonly used and the most commonly cited. And we define risk by a number of points, either for the heart score or for the EDAC score. And there is a very strong component of age, as you can see here. So less than 65 years of age, you're certainly getting less points than if you're much older than that. Now, obviously, there's a number of other factors included in all of these risk models, but I think one of the things that we should take away, especially in the acute chest pain syndromes, is that if you're at low risk, then most guidelines are advocating for discharge and no further testing. Now, intermediate is different, but really a low-risk individual, you don't even need diagnostic testing afterwards in many, many cases. So clearly, age is going to play a role here. Now, the recent uh, 2022 ACC expert consensus document on acute chest pain does look at this specifically, and again, looks at a, an assessment, first of all, with electrocardiograms, assuming that it's a non-ischemic EKG, you move down and look towards troponin ass assays, and again, I think we're all aware of the high-sensitivity troponin and its impact on our evaluations. These are now currently recommended, but based on this initial clinical assessment, ECG assessment, and troponin analysis, we can say that maybe there's a group of patients at low risk, and it says eligible for early discharge, application of the risk scores, in other words, a higher heart or EDAC score, may justify further testing, but in many cases, may not. Now, obviously, a high-risk individual with changes on the electrocardiogram, perhaps, or elevated troponins is going to move towards therapies, which we're going to hear more about uh, very shortly. And then we have this very large group of patients with intermediate risks. There's an alg algorithm recommended for repeat trop troponin testing, uh, risk assessment, reviewing the prior studies, and then it comes down to consideration of further diagnostic testing, which is where a lot of our patients do end up. Now, I'm going to also highlight what was that specific in terms of diagnostic testing. So this very complicated slide, which is an eye test for the back of the room today, basically says if you have no prior testing, then you can move towards an assessment either with coronary CT angiography or a variety of functional testing, either pharmacologic or exercise-related imaging or even just ECG testing. I'm not going to go through all these areas, but based on this slide, it looks like there's clinical equipoise between these two arms. But I think very often, many people have moved now quickly towards the uh, advocating for coronary CTA as it can establish diagnosis early, perhaps improve triage and disposition decisions. Sometimes that may require further assessments, such as with FFR CT or additional functional testing. But for the most part, this is one of the areas. If there's other prior testing involved, the algorithm is going to change. But I'm really going to focus specifically on the de novo patient who presents with chest pain. And again, at intermediate risk, I want to emphasize it's not high risk, it's not low risk. Intermediate risk, we do have a number of diagnostic options here. 
once again, just to highlight this, and I want to highlight this specifically for the person under 65 years of age. Um, again, intermediate risk individuals, we review all the information and we consider, and then we have to basically look at either functional testing or coronary CTA. And as I've mentioned, for the most part, if there's no prior CTA, for the most part, that, I mean, no prior testing, we want to look specifically at coronary CTA. And that's now, uh, in many cases, in the absence of contraindications like renal dysfunction, allergies, et cetera, et cetera, this is now the favored approach in many institutions. Okay, moving on to the other area, which is huge and very common, is the stable chest pain syndromes that we look at. And once again, there is similarity here that if it's an asymptomatic individual, well, then they wouldn't be chest stable chest pain patients, would they? And we get into more prevention. Now, how you define asymptomatic is very important. Would you consider an anginal equivalent like dyspnea? Yes, it should be considered, and that would not be an asymptomatic individual. But once again, if you're a low-risk individual, perhaps deferral from testing. Maybe you don't need additional testing. Maybe in some individuals, perhaps you do. Um, obviously, at intermediate risk, we're going to need further evaluation. And at high risk, it may need uh, more aggressive approaches, including invasive coronary angiography as the early marker and early approach. So sort of getting into this, uh, this is from the guidelines, and this is compliments of Martha Galati, who shared some of her slides with me recently. I, I totally agree with this. Non-cardiac is not a definition anymore. We used to define this with old Diamond and Forrester, which by the way, how old is Diamond and Forrester? 1973 is when it was published. Why are we still quoting this? I would think we have progressed a little bit beyond that. So atypical chest pain, don't use it and I'll try to tell you what maybe we should be using, so we don't really want to describe it. But the current guidelines from ACCAHA basically say we, oops, we should use um, cardiac, possibly cardiac, and non-cardiac. And I thought that was the standard as of 2021, but in 2023, I think those terms may have changed again, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. But certainly, let's avoid atypical, because I don't know what that means. Okay. So stable chest pain, this does look like Diamond and Forrester. As you can see here, we've got a number of categories of chest pain and dyspnea, different age cutoffs, which again, pursuant to the talk today is very important. We have divided it with men and women, but these are very, very old data. And for the most part, as you can see, if you're older and a man and you're having typical chest pain, you're gonna have a higher risk. Everyone else seems to not necessarily be there. Uh, we can include calcium scores, perhaps that does modify the risks, but the basic algorithm that's been around for a long time of pretest probability really estimates lower uh, risk than we had thought. Um, calcium scoring does improve the overall assessment, um, but it's still not perfect. Um, and clearly what we want to try to do is define uh, where the risk is. Now, the recent guidelines stipulate not an intermediate and a high risk group, but actually combined intermediate and high. Once again, differentiating the low risk chest pain group as someone who perhaps does not need as much diagnostic evaluation and therapies as perhaps the other groups. Um, and I think if there's a low risk group, again, testing can be deferred. That's an important concept here. But I wanna go back to this in a few minutes because I think the risk assessment for chest pain is really critical. Now, these are the guidelines, and they're predicated on that algorithm I just showed you on that last slide. But again, for stable chest pain, again, this is patients without known disease, and we're not defining uh, age on, in this particular slide. But for the most part, we assess clinical risk, and then you have choices of whether or not you want to define uh, further. So you have low-risk individual, no testing is recommended, perhaps considering calcium scores or exercise ECG might be an option. However, if the risk is intermediate or high, in other words, non-low, sort of like non-HDLs, um, we have coronary CTA or a lot of different functional testing. And again, this slide would indicate that there is clinical equipoise in this approach. And they want to give options for based on the patient's characteristics, institutional uh, expertise, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can follow down the algorithm into various treatment approaches and further diagnostic evaluation. But I think the key is this initial testing if it is going to be done. Um, Again, just to emphasize very importantly, routine testing of low-risk individuals, either acute chest pain or stable chronic coronary disease is not necessary in most cases. 
further assessment, perhaps with risk uh, panels and risk modification, may be reasonable. But again, it's not just automatically let's test every single person who has a shoulder ache and uh, is 21 years old. Now, the very most recent information we've gotten actually is published in this week's JAC, and it was released in March, are the appropriate use criteria uh, for ischemic heart disease and specifically focusing on the detection and risk assessment of chronic chest pain. And I'd like to highlight the words here. Okay, so the scenarios are looking at non-cardiac explanations for less likely anginal symptoms, less likely anginal symptoms in red, and then here are likely anginal symptoms. So we've gotten away from atypical, we've gotten away from non-cardiac, and now we're talking about non-cardiac explanations, less likely anginal, and likely anginal. And as we look at the various approaches, once again, if it's non-cardiac or very unlikely in a lower uh, age person and with lower risk, then for the most part in green, it's appropriate to do nothing. No further testing is indicated. Now, as we increase the overall risks, which in many cases may be with age, we can see again there's a lot of different options, most of which are very similarly categorized. Um, I would like to highlight that, you know, in someone who has likely anginal symptoms who is over 50 or has risk factors, then it becomes reasonable, at least from the, this document, to move forward with uh, cardiac catheterization. But for the most part, all of the non-invasive tests come across essentially as the same in terms of overall appropriateness for that. But I think, again, the differentiation, like the chest pain guidelines, is don't test the low-risk individual. Now, what we've seen is an evolution, I think, in the evaluation of chest pain. First of all, in symptom categorization, we've moved from typical, atypical, non-anginal, which was defined as Diamond and Forrester, and in the NICE criteria, with the 21 um, clinical practice guidelines, we've seen a change from cardiac, possibly cardiac, and non-cardiac, and now perhaps another definition of likely angina, less likely angina, and non-cardiac. I think they're all basically saying the same thing, but I think the semantics here may be important. We've also seen changes in risk assessment for chest pain, moving fortunately away from just pretest probabilities by age and sex alone. And by the way, six, less than 65 years of age, as we know, is not necessarily a pass and low risk. They do have disease, we all do. Um, we've now moved from just that to using risk factors, including family history and other factors that were not included in that initial model, and now potentially with the incorporation of coronary artery calcium scores. So looking at this again for chest pain patients, we've seen uh, in this article a few years ago, um, looking at pretest probability, it's color-coded to indicate the level of risk in these individuals, non-anginal, atypical. Again, the words are changing. Um, now incorporating clinical risk factors in addition to age, sex, and the uh, symptom categorization, and then potentially also incorporating the calcium score uh, in these patients. Now again, this is for chronic chest pain. I want to emphasize that, not in the acute setting, and that's a very important distinction. So if we look at this, overall there are changes in terms of how we could categorize. If we look at the overall prevalence of these different categories, you can see here that suddenly in the red, when we incorporate calcium scoring, we define a much larger population at low risk. And if we look at overall diagnostic accuracy, the models that incorporate not just pretest probability factors, but also risk factors and calcium scores, performs exceedingly better than the other risk models in terms of categorization of chest pain. So clearly we're moving into another era here of risk assessment for chest pain. Um, and if we look specifically at does this relate to outcomes, the answer is yes. So if we look again at the distribution of patients who have a, t a likelihood of coronary artery disease, we can see we've got a much larger increase in the very low population here um, and a lower population at the low and intermediate levels than we initially defined with Diamond and Forrester. And yet the overall outcomes of those groups is essentially the same. As you can see, it's very, very good. So for the most part, it's a better strategy, it works better, and it may save upwards of $150 million um, in diagnostic testing. Now, where are we with regards to that? And I'm getting close to the end, so I know we're running out of time, but um, I wanted to highlight the NICE guidelines because in 2016, they radically changed and moved away from clinical risk assessment and said you don't need to determine, oops, 
You don't need to determine the pretest probability. Just sort of look at the symptoms and the EKGs. And again, if they're having symptoms that are more typical, just move into diagnostic testing. And oh, by the way, coronary CTA is the test of choice. End of discussion. Now, if they have contraindications or if the, era, uh, the diagnosis is still unclear, then perhaps functional testing. But they were very clear in suggesting coronary CTA as the initial, initial strategy for possible angina. Now, I want to emphasize, because this is one of the only pieces of literature we can find on patients less than 65 years of age, the PROMISE trial, which looked at overall a low-risk cohort of patients with chest pain. Most of them were chronic chest pain patients. But it does help us sort of see where we're going here, that if we look at the patient population less than 65 years of age, overall that group had a lower prevalence of abnormal tests, either functional testing or any testing or even calcium scoring, much lower incidence. But if we look specifically at coronary CTA in this younger population, we can see that overall the patient population, while having lower uh, frequency of having abnormal coronary CT angiography, the risk of having an abnormal study was even higher than in the uh, older population. And that was very different than what we saw with functional testing. So basically, you're getting more bang for your buck in the under 65 population with regards to identifying a hazard, in this case, two to three times higher. So very important information and would really state that the test of choice in an under 65-year-old person is coronary CTA for chronic chest pain. So when we look at the guidelines, how does it weigh in with that? And that is information that was included. And specifically, it says CCTA preferable in those less than 65 years of age and not on optimal uh, preventive therapies. Obviously, again, emphasizing prevention, very important. There's a number of reasons why this should be done. But specifically, it does highlight the fact that in the under 65-year-old with chest pain at intermediate risk, CTA is probably your preferred approach in this population. So in conclusion, um, what are our, uh, where are we with this? Well, I think there's new terminology, which I think is really important to consider as we move forward. And we're all going to have to really change our vernacular once again in defining what chest pain or chest pain syndromes are all about. Uh, we certainly have to do a better job with risk. And you know, people who are still citing Diamond and Forrester and just looking at age and sex, we need to move on. We have to consider things like, you know, are their lipid panels abnormal? Uh, do they have a family history? That should certainly impact. And I think calcium scores does have a role, especially in chronic coronary disease. Um, the use of high sensitivity troponin is now the standard, uh, especially for acute coronary syndromes. Um, and non-invasive testing is really highlighted for that intermediate risk group. So maybe even very low smoldering high sensitivity levels that don't have a rise and fall pattern might be candidates, uh, or those that have excluded uh, an acute coronary syndrome but still at substantial risk. No testing is necessary in low-risk patients. Gee, I think I've said that a few times, but I think it's really important to consider both in the acute setting as well as in the chronic setting. We need to identify patients specifically that are going to possibly benefit from therapeutic interventions, whether they be pharmacologic or interventional techniques that are going to gain the most bang for the buck um, in that specific syndrome. And then coronary CTA is preferred unless the coronary calcium is markedly elevated, either on a, maybe a chest film or, or a previous calcium score. So, but in most cases, that is the preferred choice for patients under 65 years of age. Functional testing is a reasonable alternative and may be supplemental, as is doing FFR CT, which is very important to potentially assess physiologic uh, measurements of the impact of coronary flow. And I think. Uh, plaque morphology, as, as I was talking with Dr. Shazal earlier, is also very important and I think is something that we're going to need to look at um, in the future, especially in the setting of acute uh, presentations. Thank you very much.